Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Aisha Subarkat. After its swift military takeover back in August, the Taliban promised both its people and the world that its government would represent all of Afghanistan. But three months in, those promises have not met global expectations. Thousands of Afghan girls and young women have not been allowed to return to school. Taliban officials say the stoppage is only temporary and that girls will be allowed to return to school once details on how to do so in accordance with Islamic laws are worked out. But that hasn't been enough for many in the international community. Turkey and Pakistan have called on the Taliban to be more inclusive before its government is given any official recognition. And it's not just Afghanistan where rights are under threat. Across South Asia, the plight of millions in places like Kashmir have often been overlooked. A military crackdown by India continues to raise concerns about abuses there. Also in Europe, the rise of xenophobia has many worried that minority groups there could face more discrimination and violence. And to discuss the difficulties millions in Afghanistan and across South Asia are facing, I'm joined by Pakistan's Minister of Human Rights, Shireen Mazari. Ms. Mazari, thank you very much for joining us here on Straight Talk. The Taliban upon taking power, a pledge to protect the rights of women, minorities and underprivileged groups. So uh, how have been doing that? Well, I think the Taliban are obviously taking time to stabilize their own government as well. Because remember, they came to power in chaotic situations. Yes. You had every with the Americans and uh, fleeing. You had the Ashraf Ghani, the president, fleeing with bags of money, I'm told. And you had uh, the Afghan National Army collapsing. Yes. So they were, and what was uh, discovered was after 20 years, no infrastructure, no governance stability. So the uh, Taliban, that's why they call themselves the interim government, yes. because they need to stabilize their government. But all the countries, including the neighboring countries, including Pakistan, have made it clear that they have to live up to the commitments that they themselves have given regarding women's rights, because that's very critical yes. for us, regarding the vulnerable groups, the minorities. So they have to prove that they're going to live up to those uh, commitments if there's going to be international recognition yes. and mainstreaming of that government. So the thousands of young Afghan girls and uh, women have not been going to school. The Taliban says they, they, they promise actually they'll be allowed to go to school once they figure out the details uh, according to Islamic law. I mean, how important it is for women to be educated in Afghanistan? In any society, education of women is critical for the development of that society and that state. Mm -hmm. So there's no two ways on that. Um, I think the Taliban will have to provide uh, facilities for women to be educated. Yes, they can devise the ways. And I want to point out different countries devise different ways. In France, a woman, a child, a Muslim child is devoid or is banned from being educated if they wear a headscarf over their head. Yes, uh, a woman uh, cannot work in uh, some European countries and if she's wearing a hijab mm -hmm. or any religiously. So, I mean, every country devises its own laws, but I think it's crucial for Afghanistan to be able to provide for the education of women. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the problem is that a lot of schools were devastated. We are now seeing the devastation of 20 years yeah. of bombing, of fighting, mm -hmm. and actually 40 years, if you take mm -hmm. it from the Soviet invasion, and uh, buildings destroyed, infrastructure not there. So they have a mm -hmm. lot on their hands, but education has to be a priority, especially for women. You can't sort of totally isolate women the way that that was done in mm -hmm. earlier times of the Taliban. And I think the Taliban realized this, and we should actually, the international community should engage and push them and support them. Because you push somebody to the wall and isolate them, they'll become harsher. Yeah. Because we uh, hear some news, uh, Turkish Foreign Minister uh, Mevlüt Çavuşoğlu has just said that Turkey uh, has opened 10 schools for Afghan girls and uh, women. So how have Turkey and Pakistan's joint approach to Taliban that they should uphold their commitments and form a more inclusive government to, so as to get a recognition? Uh, has there been any significant change or uh, development on that I front? think that um, cooperating together, it's not just Turkey and Pakistan, it's also Pakistan, Turkey, there's uh, uh, Russia, there's China, there's Iran. Um, by supporting and encouraging 
the Taliban by helping them deal with the humanitarian crisis which is existing right now, mm -hmm. by showing them that they will it will be better for them if they cooperate with the international community and if they don't deprive their own people, especially their women and minorities, of their basic rights. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the education institutions are opening. In some parts of Afghanistan, they yes. have already opened, including the secondary schools. In some, they haven't. But this is a priority. And we, we, I think we are all making clear to the Taliban that they need to be able to move on a priority basis. And when countries like um, um, uh, Turkey actually are helping in building schools, then the argument doesn't exist that we don't have school buildings. Yes, so right. I think it's better to provide the aid and assistance to make the Taliban live up to their Come commitments to the terms, then, rather than taking Isolating punitive them, actions yeah. against them, which you just push them in a corner. Yeah. Let's move to the broader region. What could you tell us about the human rights situation in a broader South Asia as a whole? Well, I think the uh, we have mass human rights violations which are documented now internationally by the so-called democratic government of the BJP, uh, Mr. Modi's government. We've seen what they've done in Indian-occupied Kashmir. They've tried to annex it. Uh, mm. They're following the Israeli pattern in Palestine, illegal annexation, trying to change the demography, and basically using violence to actually eliminate the Kashmiris, which is like moving towards genocide. And it's become, the agenda is so obvious that even an Israeli newspaper two weeks ago, Harats, published an article saying that the Indian policies in Kashmir are very similar to what was happening in Germany in the 1930s. So the policy that the Indians are following of, following of fascism have to be countered. And it's not just in Indian-occupied Jammu and Who Kashmir. Will counter them? The, I think the international community, especially uh, Europe, which So you which believe takes, that the international the, you know, community the, cares for The Europeans rights? have brought out a new uh, policy guideline whereby they have put sanctions on Russia yes. for illegal annexation of Crimea. Crimea. And why are the uh, Europeans and the European Union not doing the same following their policy vis-a-vis -vis India? And Indians are also, by the way, uh, now cancelling the Indian citizenship of their Muslim uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. So it's across the board there's this fascism that is emerging in India and gross violations by the government itself and the state of India against its people and the people uh, of Kashmir, which is being occupied by India. Are you calling on the international community? Do you feel yes, like we do, do. you are and being we, listened to? We need to push them further. We need to, we are asking the Europeans, for example, to implement their own policies on human rights and illegal annexation. We're, we're just asking them to do what they have committed themselves to do. If you make a policy, make it credible, implement it, otherwise it becomes farcical. Mm -hmm. You cannot be discriminatory in the way you apply your uh, big moralistic policies. How has a security-based geopolitics added to the already existing problems between societies and the governments? I think that um, in many countries, especially where there is gross violation of human rights. You have a, a disconnect between civil society and governments. Mm -hmm. And again, um, I would point out specifically, India is a prime example of that, where uh, the non-mainstream Hindus are getting more and more disconnected with their state and their government. So, you know, um, when security becomes such a prime concern that you forget about human rights, you forget about your own constitutional provisions of rights. I think most democratic countries, are certainly does and others do, have uh, uh, human rights uh, in, embedded in their yes. constitutions. So let's say uh, South Asia has uh, some security concerns, whereas Europe doesn't. So um, what's your take on the rise of xenophobia and Islamophobia in Europe? It's, I, I don't know what the Europeans feel threatened from, their own Muslim citizens, because their Islamophobia is not directed so much as to external Muslim states. It's directed against their own people who happen to be Muslims, whether it's about dress, whether it's about uh, education. And by the way, there's an intense hypocrisy in the West, mm -hmm. especially in Europe, about so-called secularism. Um, how are European countries secular? If you, I just give you two examples. In Germany, if you uh, donate to your church, you get tax exemption. If you donate to your mosque, 
you don't get it. In Norway, they cut a church tax from your salary unless you give a written letter saying that you, it should not be cut. And the Queen in England is head of the Church of England. Mm. So please explain to me how, what defines secularism in Europe. Is it secularism defined in terms of denying uh, their citizens their Muslim religious identity? So there is a lot of his. Uh, and now, in some countries, when elections are coming up, Islamophobia has become the chant to get popularity yes. of a party that is declining in popularity. So what should the minorities, Muslim minorities, do across I, Europe? I think the Muslim minorities, one, need to unite. They need to also mainstream themselves. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of Muslims tend to be ghettoized mm -hmm. or to live in their own, uh, you know, little corners of where they are located. They need to be main, they mainstream themselves. They need to be more active. And they need to show that they're law-abiding citizens and they should assert themselves within the law uh, and for their rights, like non-Muslim uh, citizens of their countries. All right, Ms. Mazari, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk.